Thank you. Well, I, I would like to start by thanking everyone for, the, for this very, very uh, stimulating uh, presentations that you all uh, enriched us with. And maybe I think before, we, because I see there's many questions, there are many questions in the audience, maybe to just uh, try to have a little bit of a, of a collective discussion. I think there's like one idea that came through everyone's talks today, and that was that uh, textiles are not innocent. You know, that they're not um, you know, simple objects that, that are decorative or that, that, you know, they, they tell stories and even more than that they, they are embedded with the story of their making, with the story of their origin, of their circulation, of, of, um, of um, the blood that was, you know, <laughs> shed and the, and the tears and the, and the sweat. Uh, so there's definitely, you know, an, an important part of, the, of, of, uh, of, of this textile history. So also because of, uh, of, of the last presentation that challenged us to look at the, at the 21st century, well, of the current moment and, you know, earlier uh, during the keynote, uh, you know, looking towards the 21st century, I think I would like to challenge you all to maybe like think together how this current moment and very problematic moment in the world and, and, and the future that we are able to imagine and, and if we are, you know, actually like, you know, the moment when the end of the 21st century was brought into discussion, I, th I thought like, oh my God, that's actually like now quite an uh, optimistic way to, you know, even be able to imagine, uh, you know, this century uh, unfolding. So somehow the provocation would be for all of us to think together how is this future that we are able to imagine at the moment reflected in textiles? And, and, and how would this be um, observed archaeologically in the future when we, when we think about this moment? If indeed, you know, textiles are like the best kind of like instruments to tell the story of, uh, you know, exchanges and sort of like first globalization that, that uh, um, Ilan mentioned in terms of like Southeast Asia and the sort of connections that were happening across the Indian Ocean and across that that uh, that uh, those regions, or uh, if indeed you know like uh, you know the stories of transformation of Europe uh, is to be and, and of the economy of Europe and the and the sort of change be between a sort of like rural economy towards a towards a welfare state and then towards this sort of like new creative economy in Europe that exiled textile making to other parts of the world is also like captured in textile or in the case of Australia, so many of the sort of, uh, you, you know, episodes of, of, of um, contemporary life of the country and so many artists that, that, that um, sort of like work with like a historical reckoning. I also like remember that you work with like Juan Davila, which uh, who also did this like beautiful, you know, tapestries about the country's apology and, and they had this like big word, sorry. Um, or in the case of Indonesia, where you know you see every, the the idea of the nation, you know, on the street, on, uh, on 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 every fence. So if you think of all these possibilities, like how can how do we think that the current moment and and, and this future would be reflected in textiles? Uh, is that something we can we can sort of like try to imagine together? Add a couple of keywords from yesterday. So, of course, yesterday we talked a lot about craft, about sort of uh, uh, keeping families together, about the possibility of working with craftspeople, but also uh, working with technology, as in the case of Hosusan. Um, Sharon spoke about uh, working with artisans in very remote places and how their, their life changes as, as a sort of a modernity speeds up. Um, and so, yeah, I think let's let's uh, on top of the, the, the this sort of like more social political layer, or let's always always think about the sort of the, the, the craft and the and the capability of doing doing things with our hands, uh, but also think about technology. So those are kind of like are sort of like threads. <laughs> Who wants to start? Ah. Uh, if I may, uh, because uh, you forget that the, the sonic aspect, the dynamic me memory aspect, and um, 
I was reliving my moment of uh, also standing, rocking and rolling to a different situation in the late 60s. And I think, please remember that, you know, when I talk about craft is to care, I mean the care about relations with, between people, not always just strictly in some kind of product. There's one aspect, but I think you talked a lot about uh, sounding, the sonic, the remembering, against forgetting. And I was reminded yesterday of uh, Kada and the, um, the problematics of Gandhi. Gandhi is a problematic figure. But it's, you know, suddenly building kind of monuments to this moment, which you can read in both ways. If you uh, <clears throat> remember the problematic Salman Rushdie and Midnight's Children on the stroke of midnight, the so-called liberation, through that piece of cloth is also a very problematic moment because the cloth depends on which, which way it, it swirls and turns. And I think you were talking about, obviously, at the end of uh, the British occupation uh, and things being destroyed and suddenly what a nation becomes. How does that, that frisure, that gap, that rupture, how does that get articulated? And I think you're trying to address that and I think that is the power of what could be this idea of crafting and caring, but also um, not somehow kind of large monument, but somehow something rather small and rather in its detail. But it's also a sonic, it's also another kind of remembering. Is that right? Am I getting that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, yeah. both of you, really, because you, you, I mean, I suddenly became 21 again, which is ov obviously very dangerous. <laughs> It was very dangerous in the late 60s. <laughs> it was also absolutely bloody marvellous. But you know what I mean? There was a different kind of moment of thinking, you know, I grew up when the arguments were about, well, should, should we give up the empire? And of course, but people are still arguing about that in, you know, that little silly island I come from. And, and it's been, it's gone, you know, and it's about the different world orders, which I think you are articulating extraordinarily vividly. Um, can I tell a story? Please. Um, okay. It's just, it's just I had to just kind of rupture it into a yeah, I, else. Yeah. Um, okay, so also Friends of Chat is a, a wonderful Sabah collective called Pang Rock Sulap. And Friends of Ade in Jakarta, this is through music, yeah, ironically. Um, uh, Friends of Ade Marginal. Who are, oh, they are, they have a very super famous band, hundreds of thousands of followers, but they're also artists and they do uh, woodblock prints. So I, I, I had this incredible. Not, not marginal, re rewind. So where Pang Rock Sulap learnt from, I'm talking about a chain here. So, so marginal of Jakarta, that dynamic, dynamic scene, flies to Ranau in the top end of Borneo, at the base of Mount Kinabalu, population very small, um, through a, a DIY punk festival called Howling Mountain Festival 2013, zero sponsorship. I think Air Asia changed to Southeast Asia because uh, people could meet each other and do stuff without a huge amount of finance. It was, it's, it's doable, right? So they were, this was an international f event, the Howling Mountain Festival, Kundasang Ranao Sabah. And there were bands from uh, Singapore, West Malaysia, Marginal from Jakarta, uh, and the Philippines gathered in this town where Marginal proceeded to do uh, woodblock uh, workshops teaching to the community woodblock. Uh, a technique, yeah? Um, and then Marginal came back a year or two later. My partner, Joe's band, played in that thing. And then um, they became friends. So Marginal also learned folklore songs from the Karaza and Duson people. And they made it really popular. One of them being Aramaiti, which is in, I put in uh, Aramaiti is the motive in the mat with the fan. And so, the, the, so it was a two-way exchange. They learned woodblock, the band learned folk songs. Marginal is huge in Tokyo. So Marginal flies to Tokyo, plays all these live houses in Tokyo where they have a huge following, yeah? And they're aramaitying, a kadazan doso, an indigenous word, all over Tokyo. Come, come uh, 2016, uh, uh, I had a show at 
Yokohama, and I was in Tokyo, hanging out with the punk scene, friends, and they took me to Livehouse, no Joe, no punk rock solo, just me, and this pub of Japanese punks without another Southeast Asian in sight were aramaiting instead of kampaiing. And to me, that was, and I was like, how do they know that word? And then I had, to, I had to unpick how they know that word. And it was from this encounter, this tiny thing that doesn't register on a Richter scale. And meanwhile, we have massive institutional funding for whatever going around. But it's, what I'm trying to say is these, it's, it's this storytelling between communities of, of people who share something that brings them together in the first place. And then from there, you build a community and that community acts in resistance to something fascist or something bigger. Um, so um, that was a long way of getting to that point. Um, Yeah, but, but, but I think actually I, I, I wouldn't see that as, as in like interdisciplinary, as in like, like it's actually different boxes and then, and then, and then it's actually meeting and crossing. Uh, but actually it's, it should be, I'm talking about folklore for example, you know, like, like uh, it's interesting when we said Sonic because, uh, uh, because there's a lot of slides uh, actually since yesterday. Uh, even I saw some <coughs> things, it's actually it's, it's very... Also, at the same time, there's a sound in my head. So, I think it's just like maybe we should just like go back and then and then and then uh, maybe not seeing it as inter as interdisciplinary as in like 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 few different things and then like crossing. But it's more. It's actually it is. It's it, it's it's actually a, a complete things. And 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 I think we the one who slicing it up. And and we the one who disconnect and detach this from one to the other, and then and then and then after that we try to put it back again, and then we call it interdisciplinary. Like for example, like like for example, like if I I mean I have a lot of uh, Balinese friends. I mean I see them as visual artists because we're in art school in Jogja. But once they're playing music, and it's like uh, it's like. It's in their blood, you know. Like they, they don't, they don't. Maybe they, they maybe, maybe they don't call themselves uh, like visual artists, or but they just like playing it. Like uh, I was like, I, I never saw them rehearse, and then they play just like they they've been playing it like like uh, like years. So so I think we lose that, and and, and somehow sometimes when I see the, the some slides from yesterday and also today, sometimes I'm worried as well that that. We disconnect that. I think we should see it, like you said, like it's more, more, uh, more holistic. Uh, uh, it's 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 just more complete uh, picture rather than just design. I or I agree with you, and I think many people do. Uh, an increasing number of people like agree with this way of looking at things. But I mean, also like to provoke a little bit. For a long time, and for a few of the past decades, this slicing had been done. You know. And there was actually, uh, like, uh, I think a lot of like the conversations that we're having today, also like looking at art and textile making in the same um, paragraph, and you know this ability to sort of like indeed like get rid of this, get rid of the the categories, and and, and trying to 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 take a step from another angle and look at it holistically is a new thing, or it's it's something that has has been seen before, but there was this moment of separation. Um, and I think it's important to look at that and, you know, to understand, like, what is changing now? You know, why are we not, not even talking about that interdisciplinarity of the, of the 90s and the early 2000s, but it's about, like, indeed, like, getting rid of these categories and trying to look at, you know, uh, production uh, in, 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 different, in, in a different holistic way. So maybe, you know, our 
colleagues can also like reflect on that because I think that's a very important um, process that is happening and it's relevant I think for this discussion here that tries to look at, at art and textiles together but I think it's even deeper it's something that is one of the most important phenomena taking place in the sphere of, of, of contemporary art that we're like uh, you know most of us like busy with that that's this, this major re-evaluation re of fields. Can I just make a comment here? Uh, I think it's really interesting because it's essentially a great pool of creativity and I think for a long time cultural institutions have tended to work in a 19th century way in the way they categorise their collections, they have works of art on paper, they have paintings and so on. And I think that... that coloured people's thinking about the way they divided up creativity and I think that those boundaries are thankfully blurring again as people, as so many artists are working across extraordinary different media, whether it, whether it be music, whether it be um, political work, whether it be uh, visual arts, uh, theatre, performance, installation, uh, people are getting, having a sense of freedom now, they don't want to be categorised in a way that they were before and I think that's uh, terribly exciting because the intersections um, are very broad, they're, they're national and they're international now, and I think that there's enormous creative possibility in there. What she also said was that legacies uh, need uh, to be revisited. Uh, the urbanization um, is going on. I think, yes, I think so. And also, uh, Cosmin, you brought up earlier, you talked about uh, entry points and sort of exiting the categories. I think that it might be... I think that's kind of nail on the head. And sort of, people always talk about you, know, you have such and such an entry point, and then it's almost like you 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 enter like a club or something. You enter in, you commit to something. Whereas I like the idea of exiting something, uh, because when you exit something, you're you you of course you're going to be somewhere else. But that act of exiting is a, in my mind, a more proactive action than to have an entry point. Does that make any sense? No, but, no, but think, of, think, of, think about how art history is written, for example, and there tends to be so many categories, right? And if you recognize those categories and you purposely exit them, and in my mind, you, there's a certain amount of dismissal as like hipster territory amongst the, the art historians using these, these key words, um, um, I think that, that, to me, I'm excited by the idea of um, uh, being slightly dismissive, if I'm allowed to say that. And do you think that this is a, a symptom of a process of decolonization that is yes, going on? And that it it's is. basically about Western categories that divided things into making, and <laughs> this is what we, we're getting exactly, rid of? Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, then say exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and also highly patriarchal as well. So it's got, yeah. it's got all these really, it's, it's interesting to, I mean, it's so important. I'm not saying it's not important, but exiting is not a total rejection. I mean, you're, it's still there. You haven't like annihilated it, but you step, a, you step to another space. And a, a good art historian would follow you into the other space anyway. Oh, really? <laughs> suggested that the amateur will overtake the professional. Now, look back historically, and it's absolutely classic colonialism. The British learned to divide and rule and put people at war to one another, right? And it's happened in art history, so there was always a sense of people making and creating. And then the categorization, the split between art and craft, the split between professional and amateur, starts with the question of power. We want to keep a hierarchy, therefore we have to have the lesser thans. And I think you're absolutely right in this moment where not everywhere is being decolonized, not everyone is in that position. But basically that begins to challenge every single moment of that kind of binary opposition. I'm not sure about exiting. I think it, I've always tried to take the strategy of stepping to one side. Mm. So as soon as it's becoming another, you step to one side. So that's why I think the movement and the music and the dance is so marvellous, because you just shift the dynamic. But I come from a fairly privileged place, so...
Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually was a bit distracted sending an email about <laughs> how, how Flisco is now busy with marketing. And I don't know if it's relevant to what you were talking about. I was a bit distracted. But with what you were saying, like, how, how, how can we talk about how much we admire women in Africa without us coming there and saying, I think you are a queen? Is that already defining them in a way that, yeah, categorizing them? Like for me, I'll give you a crown. Yeah, but maybe actually, uh, yeah. Or, or, so, and it's really going there and talking with young women, with uh, young girls, super old ladies, and asking uh, how their traditions were and why have they been admired uh, by their strength. Is it because of the traditions that they couldn't speak? at the beginning, uh, like long ago, and then they found ways to be strong and fight against traditions and see the strength of young women now actually go against traditions and still stand proud. And, and how then, as a brand, you, you give them the stage without defining what they are doing and letting them have their voice, their own voice. I don't know if that was... <laughs> that's what I was writing in my email now. <laughs> And, and also how much as a brand you are allowed to be aspirational in Africa without offending the reality. It's also a topic for us. And when I work with young people uh, reinterpreting their traditions and their tribes, and it's also very delicate even to give a title to an event because if the event is in Igbo, then it, it really feels like Flisco doesn't speak Igbo. So should we... Should we not actually find an English word or a more universal word? Because as a brand, we can offend, uh, yeah, Nigeria if we pretend we know so much their their culture. And that's why it's actually very interesting if they do it, the, the young people do it themselves. So in our website, if you go, In our Flisco Co website, we quote everybody because it's really not Flisco speaking. Flisco is giving the platform for them to speak. Yeah. Did I answer? <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I think we are all talking about the kind of textile literacy. You know how to read the textile and how to read the um, um, production process behind the textile and also the um, cornea history or, you know, um, uh, yeah, the labor exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. I just wonder, um, I want to question Joanna and Antonia. So as a, because you, are, you guys are working for the institutions, what kind of the audience you are actually trying to build through the, uh, your programs and also activities? So what, you know, do you, what do you ex ex expect the uh, your audience to understand about textile issues or how to connect the, your practice to the artist or audience? What's the main challenge? Many questions in one there, I think. Um, if I uh, go back to the textile power exhibition, that was actually made for... Uh, for an age group uh, of like 14, 15, 16 year olds. Um, because we, we work a lot with, with students and uh, if we can make that story um, understandable to, to them, it's understandable to everybody, I suppose. Um, I can also see parallels to um, what we were talking about earlier about um, colonialism and um, the um, now new, new industry, new textile industry is now um, located in, in the real poor parts of Africa, for example. And it, it's got connections to 
um, colonialism in, in many ways, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the younger generation definitely have that connection to, to uh, the textile industry. I mean, uh, grandparents and parents have definitely worked there. Um, but um, the most important thing that we as a museum have to tell people today, as I see it, um, uh, about sort of mass production of textiles today, uh, is sustainability. Because... Um, that's the biggest challenge that, that textiles, uh, textile industry has to face now. It can't go on, on like it does, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I get back to the first part of your question and trying to answer that? Uh, we, have, we have a very basic uh, communication issue uh, to start with because most people still think tapestry is needlework. So we have to start by explaining what tapestry is and defining what it is and why it's important, why it's interesting and why it's exciting. Uh, we had a very strong support base uh, for a very long time and to some extent that was taken for granted. They're all getting very old and they're all dying off. So it's in our best interest if we want to be sustainable to engage the new audience and we're doing that by getting uh, young, exciting, cutting-edge artists in as our Artists in Residency program. They bring their friends, they talk about us, we get them from across Australia, we network with them through the uh, through social media and so on, and that's, we need to engage them, and we have to give them a really good time, then they'll tell all their friends about it. And so we're having to try and use whatever platforms we can to try and engage people across Australia um, and internationally and try and use any audience we can, and we try and partner with people, uh, both similar organisations and diverse organisations, because that's therein, li therein lies the fun for us, and therein lies um, the chance for pushing the boundaries and really experimenting and getting that cross-cultural exchange and cross-media exchange. So uh, we have a very tiny weeny budget, and so we have to use whatever lateral um, lateral ideas we can to try and stimulate interest wherever we can and that's one of the reasons we started playing with these young weaving classes for little kids and interestingly we even though in the old days uh, men were always the tapestry weavers in um, medieval and renaissance period now predominantly they're all women we have had young men who are really keen to join our internship program however they didn't make the final cut but we were excited to find that men were wanting to come back to, ta to tapestry or, and to textiles. And it, in, interestingly, uh, in Australia, there's some really fascinating work being done uh, in textiles by gay and transgender artists who are doing really fantastic work, uh, who are wanting to work with us and, again, push the boundaries. So we're looking at all of those creative possibilities to try and extend our message and create new audiences, both... Uh, particularly to start to start them young, get them keen, and then take them on that journey with us. Yeah, again, so this is maybe the, uh, the also, also the issue about the how much you have to defend the uh, legacy of the, your tapestry workshop. So because uh, watching the uh, artist video, you know, if you open up your studio to the punk rock artists, obviously they are going to do the really wild thing. So how much you come? go beyond that way. So that's also might help you to kind of, you know, the, uh, prolong your kind of legacy though. Well, we, interestingly you say that because we are in a, a little cultural hub now. We've got the National Academy for Music, which is uh, one of the premier places to, to train our young musicians. We've got Multicultural Arts Victoria that is uh, focused on getting multi multicultural 
artists that have come to Australia and uh, put them right in with the key uh, performing arts groups, theatre groups, symphony orchestras and so on. Uh, and also we've got a, a, a contemporary ballet studio just behind us. So we're looking at working with all of them. So we have these amazing performances in our space, which has very good acoustics, with the tapestries behind us. Um, and we have cello players from the National Academy playing with African chora players, for example. And they are just fantastic. And it's about that cross-cultural pollination. And everyone comes away richer from it. So we're doing a lot of that. But we haven't done the punk rock band yet. <laughs> Near future. Questions that want to be posed live now in the. This is the question for you. Now, our next time, how can we make a for this team that year? Not only our company, but for this team that are playing. Traditions. It seems a little bit premature for somebody like me from a completely different field to be able to enter the discourse. So I'm taking my time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I don't, I've heard lots of fantastic things. Uh, but to be direct, I don't know quite what you do, because um, I'm not from Hong Kong. But you seem to have a very hybridic and diverse background. It'd be very interesting to know uh, how you approach things in in, in this moment, because do you run a space? I, I, sorry to be so stupid, I like to ask stupid questions too. <laughs> oh, I don't want to take so much space as a moderator, but uh, <laughs> talk about me. But um, yeah. Um, sure. Um, yes, I mean, there's a space parasite which uh, has been around for a long time and I am only there for like seven years. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, following up on the discussion with um, Ilan, I think what we do is to, you know, be, bring our modest contribution to an effort of uh, decolonizing methods and spaces and and, and as part of that is also about um, looking at a different way to understand the method of working uh, as artists, as, 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 as curators. So I think the exhibition that might have been the reason why Mizuki invited me uh, uh, is, uh, is a show that we did in, well, that was at Parasite in, in March this year, but it was a show that actually originated in, I, I curated a show um, in Bangladesh, in Taka, uh, at the beginning of the year, and then it came here to, to Parasite, and then it went to Yangon, and now it's in Europe. Um, and um, textiles were, were an important part of it, although it wasn't like an exclusive part of it. It was basically as part of this effort of, of not making categories. So they were present in different ways. They were present as subjects of, of, of artworks that were made in um, mediums that would have been recognized as, as art more easily even by a non-decolonized mind. Uh, there were uh, textiles that, you know, functioned as, uh, that were made by makers that were relegated to the field of craft by the same undecolonized mind. There were also, and there were different ways of, of uh, an artist like straddling these worlds, uh, for example. Um, so that was an important part of, 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 of that show. So, um, yeah, uh, a beast of God in the line. Uh, well, <laughs> I think that was a, you can talk more about that. <laughs> the, yes. 
from from her. It's from her. Um, no, but going back, what what? No, uh, just maybe we were talking before about their engagement with the public, so delving more into the issue, becoming sort of like a an agent of concern. I would say change, but then you change the size of the discussion with things that are centered under your your guidance and your ticket. I maybe I stopped talking about parasite. Uh, no, but I think because also like to, to go back on and, and many of the discussions because I think that's really something that that I'm particularly interested in. I was just in a research trip in in, in Tonga and in Fiji and Samoa, and I also remember like some of the first visit in in Indonesia where. Uh, there was this, this conflict going on like in the 90s and, and early 2000s um, between people who were like very keen to see themselves as promoting contemporary art in, in, in many contexts of the world. And that was seen as something that was like excluding other kinds of, uh, other kind of practices. And uh, there was an, an, a, a proactive um, border that was being uh, established between, uh, you know, the... the practices that would make it uh, within within the confines of contemporary art and, and, and practices that were excluded, that were, you know, local, that were... Uh, at that point, you know, the distinction between art and craft wasn't necessarily what was what was being talked about, but it was a different way of, 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 of maintaining that. Um, and it's liberating to see that that's happening less and less, you know, in, in, in many contexts. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see that there's more people who have, like, the bravery and the vision to to, to, to straddle these uh, this worlds and to just completely like turn the system upside down. Is that, I don't know if it's a question of imagination or a question of just sort of like the way that things are more fluid, but like, yeah, like musicians are, are, are painters and painters are, are, are uh, dancers and... Uh, yeah, there is like a little bit more of freedom, and I yeah. But that's uh, that's uh, <coughs> I mean like uh, contem I mean, so-called contemporary art in Indonesia is uh, maybe like only like few cities. You know, like it's not even uh, it's in Java only maybe, and and, and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, oh yeah, and 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 in Sabah <laughs> and Kalimantan. No, so 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 it's so it's uh, uh, it's really a. Uh, no, I mean in percentage, it's it's, it's actually it's actually really small compared to like huge. Uh, I mean like uh, I think. But I'm not talking just about I'm, Indonesia. I'm, I'm talking about the Philippines, yeah, uh, I think, I think Malaysia. It's 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 uh, it's, it's, uh, it's it's new and 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 it's, you know like talk, I mean like compare it or like head to head it with the, with the, with the traditional form. It's just, it's it's not even embryo. You know it's, it's you know it's uh, it's uh, 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 I, I think we're the one who should learn a lot from. Uh, from the tradition for, traditional form, and, and it's it's more advanced, uh, 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 much more advanced. Like like in the collective manners, in collective uh, 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 conception, and then also uh, uh, even even the even uh, as institution, you know, like it's it's. Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, this categorization, for example, the education. It's 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 pretty it's pretty new, you know, like 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 I. I I was like uh, the word contemporary art in Indonesia oh, is actually uh, introduced by Chamati in Jogja and it's around 80s, mid 80s. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we know that, that there is uh, uh, arts, it's, it's, it's long, but, but you know, like, but it's, it's really a, like so contemporary art, it's, it's just 80s. So, so <coughs> and, and, uh, and education, it's, it's uh, it's also play a major role in that. Um, since I, I was encouraged, I will be, you know, self-referential a little bit. But uh, so one of the things that we actually did in the in the Bista Gondola line in the exhibition was to show, we tried to show um, how uh, different ideological discussions in the public context of Indonesia um, um, are also reflected in traditional um, textile making. And we were, we basically included uh, a sarong from Sumba um, that was, 
well, in, 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 in Sumba there is this ongoing discussion about the origin of the, of the Sumbanese people, and it's very ideologically charged. And you can hear um, ideas of, of genealogies that range from Greece to China. Um, so that the Sumbanese people came from Greece, from Arab countries, from India, from China. None of it is very accurate. Um, but um, these are ideas that circulate and based on religious and political affiliation, one would prefer one over the other. And these ideas are already reflected in the, the, w the way in which like, people choose to represent otherwise very traditional looking patterns in the, in the uh, woven sarongs of, 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 uh, of, of Sumba. So we, we, we showed a couple of those as well. And they are made now, they're made by uh, you know, weavers that you know, reflect in their work this, this idea. So I think that was an example of, you know, how in this uh, process of, of, of considering a work in textile and, and the work of visual arts at the same field is not just because of an aesthetic exercise, but it's also because they do actually uh, have the same power to, to communicate and to express, uh, you know, a sense of history, for example. So that's... Uh, A very powerful uh, uh, statement that you said how uh, you were talking about batik but like just textile in general being a device for identity a device of power a device or like a tool to 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 talk about all these complicated uh, identity topics i guess i mean not just um, yes um or a manipulation of all of the above um, and uh, because I come from not the center, um, I feel the manipulation from the center using these tools. Uh, but to me, it feels obvious. I think also in somewhere like Sabah, I don't know other places, I only know where I come from. We're also known as the land below the wind because we're, we're below the, the wind belt that unfortunately goes through the Philippines. So we always know when there's a typhoon or something like that. But quite literally, I mean, the country Malaysia formed in 1963, that's 55 years, right? So I really think that it's literally ideas are floating around. We, we don't learn our own history. The, the, the histories, whether it be of culture or sort of a literal timeline kind of history, none of that is really written down. So I think there's a lot of reinvention and ideas float around and then somebody picks up on it, whether it be the state or whether it be an artist or whomever, and then massages it into a shape, so to speak. But the, the idea can be shaped to feel like it's a really old idea, but actually it's a really fresh idea, new idea. But because it's oral tradition, because it's, uh, we're not, we don't learn our own history, there's never been a Malaysian film from Sabah in the history of Malaysian cinema, ever. I mean, these are really major things. Uh, KL people don't read our newspapers. You know, these are, so we're kind, by default, we get a kind of freedom where we can reinvent, I think. Um, that's on the, the, the issue of these, um, you know, this craft art divide kind of thing. Also, there's another thing that I think is, uh, that Sabahans are really conscious of is that we're a tipping point place in the world ecologically. And it's, a, it's something that's in our Sabah tourism board promoting to, to it's very much in our consciousness. It's, it's, our, it's our treasure, it's also our burden that we can't simply do what we want because um, our environment is really important to the world. So really small things also like this, this craft art thing uh, they're sort of a bit oblique, I suppose, but like there's economy in all of this. So as I'm working like with the Sea Peoples, there's 11 women, right? When I'm engaging them, I'm paying them really good wage. They don't go out to sea. So they don't fish the coral reef. So there's, to me, there's all these, and I'm really conscious of that. I know that if I provide them an, uh, another form of income, they won't be fishing whatever it is out of 
the coral triangle, which 70% of the world's coral species and blah, 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 you know, like a really, we have so many tipping point environmental issues. So there's a, you know, I very much claim that I'm a contemporary artist, um, but there's this vitality and there's reason also why there's this engagement as a contemporary artist. It's, it's, it's complex, yeah. Antonia, maybe you want to add something? Uh, when, since we were just touched on the on the idea of uh, art and commerce, and like because tapestry is kind of a straddles in in, in between those uh, those two uh, things. Like, how how do you guys approach it? Uh, well, or you it, don't? It, yeah. It's a, it's an imperative for us. We have to in order to survive. We have to sell our product. Uh, and it's always a real challenge because we could churn out copies of 17th century French tapestries, but that's absolutely not our vision. Our vision is to work with living creative artists and therein lies the challenge of always trying to A, get commissions, which are very hard to do, uh, and try and manufacture them out of thin air, but also work with really amazing artists and challenge our weavers artistically. So it's, it's, a, it's a really hard gig but we have to try and financially make it work for us. And we're constantly looking at how we can uh, improve our efficiencies and so on, but also how we can try and get other forms of uh, supporters engaged. And we've just, we're just now going down to the path of uh, that bureaucratic nightmare, which is getting our tax deductible status so that we can then get donations from, uh, from people directly. And that's going to really assist us in trying to maintain our viability, but also look at partnering with people too, uh, in being able to put events on, put uh, exchanges on in a way that we couldn't do. So that's always why we're thinking laterally and creatively. And I think in some ways I'm really glad that we're not supported fully by government. I mean, other parts of me would love to be fully supported by government, but essentially I find that some arts organisations that are uh, funded by government, they have an idea and if the government doesn't fund them they won't do it. Whereas we come completely the other way, we come up with the idea and then we look at how we're going to make it happen, which I, I think makes, makes us the, nimble. Yeah. Yeah. I love the idea of the dinners, eh? like I mean just as a, as a side note, eh? because like you would never think that it would be possible or practical to have a dinner inside of a, of a, of a, a tapestry studio. So it's like, I mean you have all these fabrics and you have all these dies and it's like uh, it, was an, it was a no-brainer it's the most wonderful space you can yeah. you can move all the looms around so mm. you're entirely surrounded by all these amazing uh, tapestries in the middle of production which it really explains to an audience how tapestries are made and they'd never done it so I said right we're doing it yeah. and everybody absolutely adored it and from that we get donations from that we get potential tapestry commissions and so it was just again lateral thinking of how to try and engage people differently is there, is there anything that you can share from Boris where you're engaging? Like maybe you were talking about the students and how the school is part of the... Yeah, we've got loads of, of uh, collaborations uh, and, and uh, the textile school of, of Sweden is, is one of them. Um, I was also... No, wait, wait, wait. I, I just remember actually very important to us that I wanted to ask you. At some point you mentioned that you guys uh, in that building, you share the building with other textile-related businesses or schools or like, uh, how does that work? <laughs> like from a practical point of view, I mean, are you one single organization or? Uh... No, we're all different organizations. Uh, so it's, it's a collaboration um, built on will, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll ask you a, a little bit later. So, uh, so yesterday I couldn't spend much time on my uh, so, uh, presentation, especially on the Labali and the desert people thing. And uh, so even today we are talking about history and uh, uh, how to you know, the inherit it, the heritage or tradition. And uh, uh, so for instance, the Labali and also the other community people in desert earlier, so they uh, not a big connection with the land because they are always migrating, 
and uh, in a sense, textile is always carrying their history, but they said it's a mythology or a legend. So for them, the uh, history is uh, very, very, you know, the apart thing from them. It's written by someone else. But, uh, you know, legend, mythology is always with them, with the textile. And the uh, textile is their identity. And the textile is a tool, only the tool, to connect with their ancestors. Their ancestors, you know, uh, techniques and uh, aesthetics and everything was uh, included in the, the one piece or, you know, the, the pieces they are so carrying all the time, whenever they travel. So that's a huge heritage. The value of textile is totally different from other places. And uh, the, I really wanted to you know, share that kind of thing yesterday, but uh, I spent too much time on the very general history. That's, so I'm uh, really, really, really regretting. So. <laughs> okay. Great, because and, it ties uh, in and, with today. Uh, so today, yeah. I, I, I really, really glad to hear about your presentation. And uh, it's really encouraged me to you know, uh, so um, shared about the situation of India, like so, and uh, India and Japan is really like, you know, the very similar situation today, is uh, going very nationalistic, and, uh, you know, textile is a very, very fancy thing to be used, and, uh, but, uh, and, you know, underneath a lot of, you know, uh, so deals is happening, and uh, I really, really be, be cautioned not to be used much. And uh, yes, Gandhi is very, very controversial. I just, you know, mentioned the very, very, you know, pretty things only yesterday. So, <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, many Indian artists are touching upon that issue. And uh, Gandhi is always a big icon to be used for the artwork. So, and uh, I'm very much careful to what is happening in, you know, the India and also Japan and from the, you know, behind the textile. So, um, I just have a couple of comments and just, um, so first is uh, the idea of contemporary art is a Western construct. So here, well, we're um, the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, it's been going on. It just hasn't been categorized. So I just wanted to say that. Um, the other thing is, in the last, uh, I have a gallery in Manila, and in in when I started it in 2012, uh, 2004, it's called Silverlands. Um, everyone just wanted to do painting because painting was where the money was. Um, now I'm proud that of the 24 so artists that I have, only three are painters. And I have uh, very actively four or five artists who are doing textiles. So we have tapestries, we have weavers, we have embroiderers, we have Elan, who's in her own category. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a reaching back into history, into our own art history, into our own colonial history. And it's very exciting because these are artists who've, who've been dreaming of these works and only now have the confidence to say, you know, I can do this. This is going to be what I'm... And, you know, let's say you have Norberto Roldan, who's 64 years old, who's now making embroidery. You know, so it's, it's very exciting. And I think um, this is my first time here at CHAT, and I'm blown away by the possibilities. Really blown away, because I'm blown away. So now I'm going to go back home tomorrow, and I'm going to say, guess what, guys? <laughs> you got to go. So I just wanted to say thank you and congratulations to everyone. Hungry and uh, one point. Okay. I think it, it serves to remember that the biggest strength, the 
It serves to remember at this point in time that the biggest trade route in the world uh, um, was named after textiles, the Silk Route. Actually, that's a very good phrase that's to finish good, the... That's a very good point. That's actually a very, very good thought to finish this, uh, these, two, uh, these two days. Eh? How we're sort of like re reinstating a, either whether it's a starting point or an end point or a passing point of, of this sort of like new globalized... Reinstating the importance of textiles. Ah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, making connections all across the world through this thread that is textiles. That, that's why we're all here tonight. So in saying that, I don't know if Mitsuki and Chin Chin have anything to say. Ah. Internships, yes. Yeah, we're looking for interns. If you know any fabulous interns, send them our way. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Cosme, so much for coming over. Thank, thank you, you for uh, sort of sharing your experience. And thank you to all the speakers that have been really fabulous. I'm sure that we will continue to talk and have these discussions in many, many, many more shapes. I hope we can continue to collaborate. I hope we continue building this network. I hope you, need, you meet the, uh, the, the speakers we will have next year, that you meet the speakers that we've had in the last two years, and that little by little we sort of grow this network of crazy <laughs> textile people. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone from me and Mizuki. Um, we've had a fabulous two days of the textile series 3.2 and uh, it got us um, thinking a lot about what it really means to have a textile legacy. For a lot of the textile uh, practitioners, a lot of them T use textiles as their form of livelihood, their trade, their identity, but we've kind of also elevated this whole discussion into a totally different stratosphere about how institutions can help preserve that and how artists can help uh, reinforce those ideas. And a, a lot of times we think of textiles, a lot of people think of them as utilitarian objects. It's just a scarf that keeps you warm, a coat that uh, prevents the you know, wind from making you chilly, um, an umbrella that shades you from the sun. But actually, in, the, in its many uh, forms and its many shapes that it takes on, it, it actually imparts um, a lot of uh, cultural meaning and identity to not only the makers, the users, but also the every one of us who are trying to make, um, uh, you know, a better a weaved story together on how this connects all of us um, as a, you know, humanity in this big fabric. So thanks again, and I hope we'll see you again for uh, our chat programs that come up uh, in the coming months. We are having our grand opening in uh, March 2019, March 16. So that will be a fabulous show. And if you have time today, we close at seven. So have a tour uh, of the Archiving the Mills exhibition that is downstairs. Uh, thanks again to the team who worked so hard to let this happen, the participants and all our speakers. Yeah. So can we announce for the speakers to come for the photo opportunity? First, day two speakers, please uh, stay on stage for the for the day two photograph, and then we'll follow that with the chat team members to come on stage as well. Okay, so, um, all the speakers for day two, please come up to have your group picture, please. Paula as well. Claudia. Could we have a good picture? Yep. So day two speakers, I think we have everyone. Yeah. Yeah, different fields.
with those ah, people. Exactly. So. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> this way. Oh, we have to move back. Oh, we have to move yeah, back exactly. a bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. We got day two speakers and then everyone, then all the speakers and chat team. And all the speakers for day one and day two. And the advisory panel of chat. Also, so. <laughs> advisory panel, day one speakers. We need two roles, I think. Yes. Yeah, two yeah. roles. Two roles, exactly, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. Two roles, yeah. They, they, yeah. Ah, the advisory panel. <laughs> okay, that's good. Ha <laughs> ha.